Welcome to According to Sam, folks. This is episode 253. Thank you for tuning in and joining me. Got a really good show for you today. Going to pick up uh, getting back into the 2008 financial crisis, the Great Recession, what led up to that, uh, what happened after that. We're going to start getting into Obama's role uh, uh, today. But I want to start today's podcast by clearing up some misinformation, I guess I was spreading in my last podcast, because in my last podcast, I was explaining to you how FEMA um, is is broke, doesn't have any money for uh, the victims of Hurricane uh, Helene, um, doesn't have any money for the new hurricane that's getting ready to uh, strike uh, Florida, and they're requesting more money from from Congress, that Congress needs to come back and allocate more money to FEMA. And I said that, uh, and a lot of people have been saying that FEMA is broke because they've been spending money on migrants. Well, turns out that that's not the case, according to FEMA. Um, and we'll start with this clip. Uh, take a listen. And George, there's a real concern this morning that this misinformation could actually prevent people from getting the critical help that they need. And that's why that FEMA tool is so important. By the way, we should also tell you here that FEMA says that the money used for migrants actually came from a separate fund, not the fund used. Oh, so that's why I was spreading misinformation, because the money that they spent on the migrants uh, came from a separate fund. So FEMA has has two different funds. FEMA has a migrant fund and they have a fund for Americans uh, that are suffering from disasters. So the money that they gave to the migrants, the uh, one and a half billion dollars that that they used uh, for migrants, that didn't come from the American disaster uh, fund. Uh, That's a different fund is what FEMA is is telling you. I want you to take a listen to uh, Maria Bartolomo. Uh, she's interviewing um, um, what's her name, um, Tulsi Tulsi Gabbard. Here, take a listen. The White House is trying to tell us that no, no, no. This is two different pools of money. We're not. You. We didn't use FEMA money for the illegals, but. Karine Jean-Pierre actually told us what they were doing back in 2022. Watch this. It's absolutely outrageous. Listen. FEMA regional administrators have been meeting with city officials on site to coordinate to coordinate available federal uh, support from FEMA and other uh, federal agencies. Funding is also available through FEMA's emergency food and shelter program to eligible local governments and not for non for profit organizations upon request uh, to support humanitarian relief for migrants. For we'll migrants. continue to do what we can as a federal government to support uh, these cities as we rebuild our asylum processing system after it was gutted, uh, by the Trump administration. Yeah, there you go. Busted and busted again, Tulsi. She just told us what she was doing in 2022. They've actually cleaned out the money because they gave it to illegals. Is this? No, that's a different pot. That's a different pot. That's a different fund. <laughs> There's two different funds is what the Biden administration wants you to believe. That uh, they have a migrant fund and a fund for Americans, and the the one point uh, one and a half billion dollars that they gave to the migrants that didn't come from the uh, fund from Americans. Now this is absolutely ridiculous. FEMA only has one uh, budget allocation that is given uh, to FEMA uh, by Congress. FEMA doesn't have uh, separate pots for migrants and separate pots for Americans. And if that is the case, um, uh, we know you spent one and a half billion dollars on migrants. What's the budget that you had for Americans? But it's ridiculous. It's not misinformation. There's no separate pots. It's absolutely ridiculous. This is uh, Karine Jean-Pierre today in uh, the press conference today. Take a listen. So disaster relief, this is a falsehood. Disaster relief funds used on immigrants illegally in the U.S. The fact is no money is being diverted from response. Diverted. No money is being diverted. So that's that's the, the word that they're hanging on, that, that Trump is spreading disinformation because he's saying that money 
from FEMA is being diverted to illegal immigrants and no money's been diverted. That came from a separate FEMA pot. That, that's, that's separate funds that we gave the migrants $1.5 billion, $1.4 billion. That's separate. No money's being diverted is, is, is the word that they're throwing in there so they can make you think that, that Trump is spreading misinformation or people are spreading misinformation that are saying no. <laughs> Nobody's saying anything about being diverted. We're saying FEMA needs Congress to come and pass more funds and give them more money because nobody cares what fund it came from, what pot it came from. You spent a hundred or you spent uh one point five billion dollars on migrants, and now you're coming back and saying Congress needs to approve more money for d- disaster victims. Here's Karine Jean Pierre again getting into it with uh Ducey. to the impacted areas. And but instead people want to do disinformation, misinformation, which is dangerous. Misinformation, disinformation. Because then it, what that, when, when folks on the ground hear that, they may not want to ask for the help that they it's need. It's ridiculous. That there for them. It's ridiculous. That so there that's them. the other that's ridiculous that. part, too, is don't criticize us, you know, because if you're criticizing us, then that's going to, to hurt people and damage people. No, fool. You're the ones that are hurting people and damaging people. No, you deserve criticism. So that's the other part of it. And if you're criticizing FEMA, if you're criticizing the administration, then you're hurting the aid effort, which nothing can be further from the truth. It's absolutely ridiculous. Don't criticize us because then you're further um, uh, hurting the aid effort, which is feckless as it is. People want to do disinformation, misinformation, which is dangerous, which is dangerous. Because then it, what that, when, when folks on the ground hear that, they may not want to ask for the help that they it's need. It's ridiculous. That is there for them. <laughs> that is there for them. That's our focus here. But President Biden is fond of saying, show me your budget and I will tell you what you value. If he's got money for people in Lebanon right now without Congress having to come back, what does it say about his values? There's not enough money right now for his people values, in North Carolina who need it. That's not misinformation. Wait, no, that is wait, your whole your whole premise of the question is misinformation, sir. It has the question. Yes. Your whole premise of the question is misinformation. How's the question going to be in, misinformation? Answer the question. The question is not misinformation. What you're spouting here from the podium is misinformation. Your whole your whole premise of the question is misinformation, sir. It's, what you don't? Mean, yes, yes, it's part? misinformation. Did, is there I money just, to I just mentioned. Right now? I just mentioned. I just mentioned to you that we provided more than two hundred million dollars to folks who are impacted in the area. Two hundred million. With you. Two hundred million. The migrants got one and a half billion. Two hundred million, huh? Million dollars. So 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 they got two different funds. <laughs> They got uh, FEMA has has two different two different um, uh, pools of funds. One for Americans for disaster relief, and and one that they use for migrants. And and let's listen again. FEMA says that that the funds that went to the migrants those are different funds. Those are different FEMA funds than from the funds that that we have for Americans for disaster relief. So he says that they need. And that's why that FEMA tool is so important. By the way, we should also tell you here that FEMA says that the money used for migrants actually came from a separate fund, separate not fund, the fund used for disaster. Not the, se- not the separate fund. FEMA, FEMA's got a separate fund for Americans and a separate fund for migrants. And the fund for migrants, they spent one and a half billion dollars on them. Green Jean-Pierre says that Americans got 200 million. And now they're coming back and now they're saying Congress needs to come back and approve more for Americans because the Americans fund is busted. But the migrant fund, they got one point four billion. It's misinformation. Did, is there I money just, to I just mentioned right now? I just mentioned I just mentioned to you that we provided more than two hundred million dollars to folks who are impacted in the area. And I just shared with you that people are deciding not to not, people are deciding not to President not to wait. To Congress that there's not enough money to help people. We're in North talking Carolina about the SBA by, disaster loan. That's yes. money for people in North but, Carolina. And that's important and people in North Carolina need that. Wait, this is nothing new. Peter, this is nothing new. 
Congress comes together, they provide money, millions of dollars, for disaster relief. We're asking them to do the job that they have been doing for some and time. I'm from a letter that President Biden sent doing to for Johnson, some McConnell, time. Schumer, and Jeffries. The president's letter is not misinformation. Would you agree? No, the way you're asking me the question is misinformation. There is money. The way you're at the way you're asking me the question, that's the misinformation. The way you're asking me the question, that's misinformation. That's what she said. Misinformation, would you agree? No, the way you're asking me the question is misinformation. There is money that we are allocating to the impacted areas, and there's money there to help people who truly need it. There are survivors who need the funding, who need the funding, and it's there. You don't like misinformation. I said that, I actually said, we have the money available to help uh, survivors of Hurricane Helene and also Hurricane Milton. Now, we're, now there's going to be a shortfall right? He said, listen to her. Yeah, we have the money, but there's going to be a shortfall. We don't have enough money. Why don't you have enough money? Why don't you go over to the, the, the fund that you have allocated for migrants? And why don't you get into that fund and, and, and see if that can cover some of the shortfall? Why don't you do that? Help uh, survivors of Hurricane Helene and also Hurricane Milton. Now, we're now, there's going to be a shortfall. There's going to be a shortfall. We don't know how bad it's Hurricane Milton is going to be. And so we're going to need additional funding. We're going to need additional funding. That's exactly what I just asked about. And you said it was no. misinformation. Yes. What you're asking me is why Congress needs to come back and do their job. That's what you're asking me. Congress needs to come back and do their job and provide extra assistance, extra funding. We need extra funding. We need extra. This is So that's what this is about. That There's two separate piles that FEMA is is working on a pile for Americans for direct disaster uh, relief and uh, a pile for migrants. Migrants got one and a half billion dollars already. They said they have uh, two hundred million allocated for um, for these hurricane victims, but there's going to be a shortfall, and that Congress needs to come back and allocate some more money. That's what they're saying. So I hope I cleared that up for you. Um, I, I hope. Um, that you can forgive me for spreading mis and disinformation in my last podcast by saying that FEMA doesn't have any more money because they gave it all to the migrants. Hope you accept my apology. All right, let's get back into what we've been talking about, the Bush-Clinton dynasty, people. The Bush-Clinton dynasty, and we've been talking about how the Bush-Clinton dynasty, the Bush-Clinton dynasty has governed uh, over the United States um, and has been the uh, one of the members of the Bush Clinton dynasty has been the chief executive president of the United States for the past uh, 32 of the uh, of the past 36 years, 32 out of the past 36 years. Uh, a member of the Bush Clinton dynasty has been president and they have destroyed our country. They have put us on a uh, a, a terrible uh, trajectory. Um, uh, uh, the path that we're on, uh, 65% of the country says that we're on the wrong path. And it's been as high as 70% of the country saying that we're on the wrong path. And these guys put us on the path, on that path, the Bush Clinton dynasty. They, they increased the debt. They took us to wars. They, they set up everything in our country that is negatively affecting our country today. And they are telling you that this guy is responsible in his four out of the last 36 years. His four years are responsible for all of your problems. And we've been talking about that in the past few podcasts. Uh, we uh, got diverted in the last podcast talking about the hurricane and hurricane victims and the fact that Joe Biden gave all their money away to the migrants. But we're back on this story today. And uh, Trump was back in Butler, Pennsylvania, where this assassination uh, attempt took place. Um, a few months ago, um, ABC News um, yesterday on their Sunday show. I want you to listen to this uh, report from Rachel. Uh, what's her name? Uh, the black reporter, Rachel Scott. Um, listen to what she says here. This is a little um, a report that she does about Trump's uh, campaign event back in Butler, Pennsylvania over the weekend. Oh, I love that. I love that chart. I love that graph. 
The former president and his son, Eric, with no evidence, both suggesting his political opponents were behind the July assassination attempt. Over the past eight years, those who want to stop us from achieving this future have slandered me, impeached me, indicted me, tried All to true. throw All me true. off the ballot. And who knows, maybe even tried to kill me. They tried to kill him. And it's because... Check the out how they added government. that together. And have you watched this... Uh, so there was all about forcing everybody to denounce the fact that President Trump says that his political enemies tried to kill him. Uh, Trump says that they, they indicted him, they impeached him, they tried to kick him off the ballots, everything that they've done. And he says, maybe even tried to kill me. And then they edit in uh, <laughs> uh, Eric Trump saying they tried to kill him. And they're trying to make the case that that Trump and uh, and his family and surrogates are, are blaming Democrats for trying to kill him. But then, then Rachel Scott says this. He tried to throw me off the ballot, and who knows, maybe even tried to kill me. They tried to kill him. And it's because the Democratic Party, they can't do anything right. They can't do anything right. Authorities have found no political motivation connected to the gunman. So <laughs> the authorities have found no political motivation connected to the gunman. <laughs> no political. First of all, I'm not even sure that the gunman acted alone, quite frankly. <laughs> but why are they trying to kill him if there's no, there's no political motivation? What's wrong with you people? Our media is so disgusting. Our media is is our enemy the the mainstream media the 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 legacy media is your enemy they, they're your enemy they hate you they hate you and they and they will they will do anything to to keep the status quo to to keep the the uh establishment in power and in control and the establishment is 100% in control. The Bush Clinton dynasty is 100% in control under the Joe Biden administration and will be under the Harris administration. Because the Harris administration would be a continuation of the Bush Clinton dynasty, just like the, the Biden administration is a continuation of the Bush Clinton dynasty. It is the uh, political establishment the political elite, and it is uh, the status quo. That is a vote for Kamala Harris is a vote for the status quo. Although she's running on change. She's running on change you can believe in. And just like Obama in 2008, this was uh, one of the uh, signs that Obama used in 2008. If you got an Obama yard sign, you saw these yard signs all over the country. Obama. Change you can believe in. I'm bringing the change. But in reality, when Obama got in office, and you're going to see more of that today as we get into this and in the next podcast, as we start talking about Obama's role in the housing crisis, that it was a lie. There was no change at all. He ran on change. He said that he was going to change and that he was going to uh, change the direction, the uh, trajectory of the country, because everybody even back then believed that the country was on the wrong track. And he said that he championed change. I am the change agent. I'm going to bring the change. That's what he ran on. You know, we're going to talk about all the, uh, the rhetoric and stuff that he used in that campaign in 2008. He didn't bring any change, no change. And the reason I'm talking about this and talking about it in regards to Kamala Harris is because she's trying to run the same campaign. She's trying to run as the change agent. And I want you to understand the change that we got from Obama because it's the same change that you can expect from Kamala Harris. It's going to be the exact same change. Kamala Harris even has Obama coming out this week. And the, the, the timing of doing the, the podcast today and the one that I'm going to do on Friday, it's great timing because Obama's hitting the campaign trail this week for his girl, Kamala Harris. And I'm going to tell you about Obama and the change we got from Obama. Obama to campaign for Harris in final weeks. This clown. We're going to talk about Obama. So in the past few podcasts, we've also been talking about these guys. These are the guys in the Clinton administration in the 1990s that set up 
the crash that set up the financial crisis that led to the Great Recession and uh, and the wealth transfer. And they set the whole thing up with the deregulation, uh, not uh, allowing Brooksley Bourne to uh, regulate derivatives. They repealed Glass-Steagall. Uh, there was more deregulation that these guys did, and they set up the the um, the um, economy not only of the United States but the global economy uh, for a crash. And these guys are Robert Rubin, who was Bill Clinton's Treasury Secretary up until his last year, and then his protege uh, Larry Summers became Treasury Secretary in Bush's. I mean, in Clinton's last year, and then Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan first became Treasury Secretary uh, during uh, Ronald Reagan. Alan Greenspan was brought into politics as an economic advisor to um, uh, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, who sat on the Warren Commission and who replaced Richard Nixon. Um, Alan Greenspan also worked for Brown Brothers Harriman, um, uh, the banking firm that George Bush's grandfather also worked for. So Alan Greenspan, uh, Larry Summers, Robert Rubin, and let's not forget Timothy Geithner, because Timothy Geithner was there. It was these four players in ninth, in the 1990s that set up the crash. Don't forget these names. Timothy Geithner, Robert Rubin, Larry Summers. So we also have been talking about this secret document. The secret document that um, it was um, it it was crafted and 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 uh, passed around in the Clinton administration in his last year in those last months of the Clinton administration. Uh, this is the document. It was retrieved through a FOIA request, and you can see that the draft date here is 11 3 uh, 2000 so this uh, 2000 was an election year uh november 3rd if this is not the election day this is either uh close to before or after the election day in in 2000 and if you remember the election in 2000 wasn't settled uh for weeks later because you had bush v gore you had the uh court cases and all of that so this document life after debt that uh, Larry Summers, Alan Greenspan, and other economists in the Clinton administration were passing this document around. Even though it was an election year, they didn't make this document public and make this part of the campaign uh, that year. They kept it uh, secret. They kept all this secret. And they, the document was warning of a crisis. The crisis was that the United States was going to be completely debt-free in 12 years and uh, it was something that they had to to uh, avert. It was something that they had to address this crisis. Again, the crisis was the United States was going to be completely debt free. I've told you that um, around this time when this document was written um, in 2000, the national debt was around four trillion dollars, including Social Security. This is it right now. I mean, look how fast we're going to I mean. I think we hit 35 uh, trillion in in February. When did we hit 35 trillion? February or March? Six months. That's what we're looking at. We're going to be another trillion dollars. We're adding a uh, trillion dollars to the national debt now every six months. The interest alone servicing this debt is a trillion dollars. Um, so uh, I don't. I've been asking the question, how would you address the problem in 2000 if you saw a crisis that the United States was going to be completely debt-free and you had to avert that crisis and you had to address it, what would you do? I've been asking that question. Just think about what they did because they definitely averted the crisis. <laughs> they definitely averted it. So we've been talking about all that. Uh, we were talking about uh, the crash and the bank bailout. Um, and, and TARP and how, uh, Congress approved, uh, $700 billion to uh, essentially give to Hank Paulson, who was the treasury secretary and the chairman of the then chairman of the federal reserve, which was Ben Bernanke. And this was, uh, $700 billion that they were going to use to stabilize the economy and buy troubled assets. That's what the, 
the bill was called uh, TARP, the Troubled Assets and Relief Program. And um, what it was designed to do, come up here to purpose, purpose uh, was to purchase uh, two different types of troubled assets. First were uh, commercial and residential real estate. And then uh, second were, uh, were financial instruments. And these financial instruments were mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, um, and also derivatives. And we're going to talk about this today. The, the derivatives that were in question were derivatives of uh, collateralized debt obligations, the, the CDOs. Um, uh, in short, this allows Treasury to purchase liquid uh, difficult to value assets from banks and other financial institutions. The targeted assets can be collateralized debt ob obligations, CDOs, which we're going to talk more about here in a moment, which uh, were sold in the booming market up until 2007 when they were hit by widespread foreclosures on the underlying loans. Uh, TARP was intended to improve the liquidity of these assets by purchasing them using secondary market mechanisms, thus allowing participating uh, institutions to stabilize their balance sheets and avoid further loss. So this was the bank bailout. Um, so we were talking about the derivatives uh, and explaining how Brooksley Bourne tried to regulate the derivatives back in the late 2000s or late uh, 1990s in the Clinton administration when these guys were deregulating everything, when they were repealing Glass-Steagall, and they went to Congress and they blocked her and they fought her from regulating these derivatives. And we've explained that derivatives, uh, the over-the-counter derivatives, the over-the-counter marketplace was a complete black box that uh, we're talking about trillions of dollars, uh, somewhere in, in the range of, of 27 to $30 trillion at this time. It's a much bigger marketplace now, but at this time, uh, about $30 uh, trillion marketplace, completely black box, uh, completely unregulated. Uh, the government, uh, the SEC, nobody knows what's going on. And, and this is, these are uh, financial instruments that, that Warren Buffett called in 2002, financial weapons of mass destruction. And these men stopped Brooksley Bourne, don't forget Timothy Geithner, Timothy Geithner, they stopped Brooksley Bourne from regulating these derivatives. So we talked about all of that. Um, again, derivatives are financial instruments. They're contracts that are derivative of an underlying asset. And the underlying asset can be anything. The underlying asset can be stock in a company. It can be uh, the housing uh, price or, or CDOs or, um, or mortgage-backed securities. It can be commodities. It can be student loan debt. Um, it can be even other derivatives. Derivatives are just financial contracts that um, are derivatives or underlying assets. So if the underlying asset has value, the derivative has value. If the underlying assets become worthless, then the derivatives come uh, become worthless. So we explained all of that and how Brooksley Bourne was trying to regulate them in the 1990s and, um, and how Alan Greenspan told her that the market, the market will figure out fraud, that fraud doesn't need to be regulated, that we're going to let the marketplace Figure out the fraud is what Alan Greenspan told Brooksley Bourne. And that's all in the warning documentary, which I recommend you going and watching. Robert Rubin, um, check out this article. Let's read the, uh, the, the subtitle. Rethinking Robert Rubin. As Treasury Secretary, Robert Rubin oversaw the last great roaring economy and set the table for its demise. So why would Robert Rubin be overseeing the last great economy? He also saw when Robert Rubin was uh, Treasury Secretary, and then when uh, Larry Summers came in after him for that last year, that was the last time we had a balanced budget. Back here in, in the 1990s is the last time we had a, a, a roaring economy, it's the last time that we had a balanced budget. It's the last time we had uh, budget surpluses and not deficit spending. All that back in this situation. Now, why was that the last time? If you understand this document and the fact that they that they saw 
uh, the United States becoming debt-free in 12 years as a crisis. If you understand this, then you understand why it, it, it was, it's been 25 years since we've had a balanced budget and that, and that we haven't had deficit spending. And, and the last good economy was under these guys is because they, they saw it as a crisis that the, that the United States was prosperous, that the United States was paying off its debt. The United States was going to be debt free. And it was a crisis that they had to avert because of that sweet usury. I told you about that usury. <laughs> so that's why it was the last great economy. That's why it was the last time that we passed a, a, a budget and we had budget surpluses and a balanced budget and didn't have deficit spending back then is because that was the problem. Rethinking Robert Rubin as treasury secretary, Rubin oversaw the last great roaring economy and set the table for its demise. After Rubin um, resigned from the Clinton administration in the summer of 1999, he went to work for Citigroup. And I told you guys that Citigroup is the, is the, the bank that, that Robert Rubin and, and Alan Greenspan and, uh, and that team, the reason that they repealed Glass-Steagall was for the benefit of Citigroup. So they repeal Glass-Steagall, this legislation uh, that goes back to the Great Depression that's, that separated investment banks from, from commercial banks. They repeal that for Citigroup. He retires from the Clinton administration, leaves the Clinton administration in the summer of 2009 after setting this whole thing up, all this deregulation, repealing Glass-Steagall, fighting Brooksley Bourne on regulating derivatives, all this stuff, leaves it to Larry Summers uh, for that last year of the Clinton administration. And then he goes to work for Citigroup. He becomes the chairman of Citigroup. Let's read this again. At Treasury, <laughs> as Treasury Secretary, Robert Rubin oversaw the last great roaring economy and set the table for its demise. At Citigroup, he was paid $126 million dollars uh, and the firm almost perished. The tale of a a wise man, and that's what they called these guys, the wise man, um, and a phantom. The tale of a wise man and a phantom. So this is a great article. I don't have time to go deep into it, but uh, you should definitely check it out. It's in Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg, and it's uh, rethinking Robert Rubin. So uh, he set it up, and then he went to work for Citigroup, and then he bails out a Citigroup with $126 million right before the crash as if he knew the crash was coming. And of course he did because he set it up. He set it up. All right, so at the end of the, uh, not the last podcast, but the podcast before that, we started talking about the repo market. Um, I want to get uh, go into this and explain a little bit more about how Bear Stearns, Bear Stearns was the first bank uh, to collapse, and then that started the avalanche uh, where more other banks, Lehman Brothers and other banks were uh, exposed. Um, but the, the repo market played a big part in what uh, brought down Bear Stearns um, repo market. Repo means repurchase agreements. And um, hold on, what's going on here? All right. Repo means repurchase agreement. And uh, let's read a little bit about what uh, what repo is. Repurchase agreement, also known as repo, uh, RP, or sale and purchase agreement, is a form of short-term borrowing, mainly in government securities. Uh, the dealer sells the underlying security, and the security can be anything, uh, to an investor uh, by the agreement between the two parties, uh, and then the person who it's a form of collateral. The bank that that uses the security to do a short-term uh, borrow uses it as collateral, and then they promise to pay it, pay it to buy it back. That's why it's called repurchase. Um, the agreement between the two parties buys them back. Shortly afterwards, using the following, uh, usually the following day. So these are 20, 24 hours or these transactions taking place within 24 hours at a, a slightly higher price. Uh, the repo market is an important source of funds for large uh, uh, financial institutions and non-depository banking sector, which is also uh, known to rival 
the traditional depository banking sector in size. Large institutional investors such as money market mutual funds lend money to financial institutions such as investment banks, and Bear Stearns was an investment bank, uh, either in exchange for or uh, secured by collateral. So the treasury bond or the security, whatever you're using to give uh, to the other banking institution for collateral, they give you money and then you buy the collateral, these securities back later. This paragraph. In 2007 and 8, a run on the repo market in which funding for investment banks was either unavailable or at a heavy or at a very high interest rate was key was the key aspect of the subprime mortgage crisis that led to the great recession. So the the repo market was an integral part of what led to the downfall of Bear Stearns and then um, also exposed Lehman Brothers and the and the other banks. So um, uh, again, I have a clip here about the repo market. I want you to take a look. The repo market is often referred to as the plumbing of the financial system. And just like the plumbing in your home, you're unlikely to think about how it operates each day until something goes wrong with it. So you'd be forgiven if you had no idea just how important the repo market was until you started hearing about all the issues with it in the financial news last year. But this is a market that has a turnover of one to two trillion dollars per day. One to two, one to two trillion dollars per day. Again, these are 24 hour transactions. One to two trillion dollars per day in the repo market. Trillion over of one to two trillion dollars per day. So it's pretty big. Repo stands for repurchase agreement and is basically a form of short-term borrowing where securities and especially government securities are used as collateral. The reason this is called a repurchase agreement rather than just a collateralized loan is down to the way the transaction is done. Essentially, the repo market is like a huge pawn shop that's pawn with a W. So let's say you have bank A, which is holding a lot of cash, more than they need. And you have bank B that has some treasury bonds, but needs to raise cash. In a repurchase agreement, bank B will sell its treasury bonds to bank A, but the agreement will state that bank B will repurchase the treasury bonds back from bank A at a later point in time for a higher price. This is usually overnight or within 48 hours, but it can sometimes be longer. Now, since Bank B is buying the treasuries back for a higher price, the difference between the price it sold them for and the price it buys them back for is the equivalent of paying interest for borrowing the money. And 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 again, they don't have to be treasury bonds. They can be any securities. They can be uh, these collateralized debt obligations, the derivatives that derived from the collateralized debt obligations. All right, so let's listen to more about what happened to Bear Stearns in March of 2008. Again, March of 2008 is an election year. Um, Barack Obama is in the primary uh, in that year running against uh, Hillary Clinton uh, in that primary, and he's accusing Hillary Clinton in the primary. He's dogging Hillary Clinton uh, about her husband and how her husband let these let these guys uh, deregulate everything in his administration. He's dogging her in, in the primary before he even gets in the general election. We're going to listen to some of his rhetoric because he was running on change. I'm going to change everything. So I'm coming in first running against Hillary Clinton in the primary, and I'm, I'm dogging her about all the deregulation that happened at, during her husband's administration. And then when he secures the nomination in the summer of 2008, after this crash is already well on its way, and he's running against uh, John McCain in the general, then he, there's a lot. And remember, he's a senator too. He's a senator at this time. So he has to vote for the bank bailout. So he's on the floor of the Senate uh, giving his opinion about what he's going to do if, uh, you know, if, if he's elected and what needs to happen, all this stuff, all this rhetoric from this guy who was running, just like Kamala Harris, on change. Change you can believe in. That's what he was running on. <laughs> I'm going to show you a change you got from this guy. So all of this that, 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 that was happening started in March of 2008. 
Obama's running. He's a senator. We're going to talk about his role in this. Bear had borrowed heavily to invest in toxic assets and other high-risk securities. To survive, it would have to find more lenders willing to loan it money. Bear Stearns rolls over its loans every night or every few nights in what's known as the repo market. And that gives its lenders an opportunity each night if they want to, to call in some of their loans or to demand more collateral. What this amounts to effectively is that investment banks, there's a vote of confidence every night on whether they survive or not. And that night, the markets were voting no confidence in Bear Stearns. Their stock was dropping and the cash reserves were beginning to dwindle. This stuff became a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, a lot of people that perhaps would not have acted in listening to some of the things that were going on said, you know, I can't leave my assets there anymore and I have to take them out. You're sitting in the middle of an avalanche. What can you do if you're on the side of a mountain and an avalanche comes at you? An avalanche goes, what, 60 miles an hour? You can't outrun it, right? So what can you do? The story has continued to mushroom. Uh, there are concerns amongst perhaps some farm. On Thursday, Bear's stock continued to fall, and the reserve was almost completely gone. By 6 o'clock, it's very clear that they do not have enough money to open the next day. They have 12 to 14 hours to do something unprecedented in terms of raising emergency capital or go under. So what was happening here was that that these banks that they have been doing business with and using these derivatives, using these CDOs and, and other securities as collateral in these repurchase agreements, um, because these these uh, the troubled assets were worthless and have become worthless, none of these banks would would loan them money would would use these these instruments as collateral so they couldn't get any money and then their stock stock tr started to fail because uh, people started spreading rumors that they had no liquidity and they didn't have any liquidity i mean the 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 instruments that they were using to borrow money were worthless now who knows how long they had been worthless <laughs> you know they were they were able before the rumors started and their stock price uh started to uh fail they were using these instruments as collateral and, and other banks around the world, uh, they were uh, lending Bear Stearns and these other banks money uh, in these repurchase repo agreements. But all of a sudden, someone spread the rumor and the rumor got out that that these things were worthless and nobody wanted to take them. They were asking for for different types of collateral, uh, more stable collateral, or or um, outrageous interest rates uh, that that these banks were not going to be able to pay, and that's why they couldn't get any money, and that's why Bear Stearns ended up failing. And you're going to see that it had largely to do with derivatives that were derivative of collateralized debt obligations. They had one last chance. The Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Tim Geithner was in charge. Geithner is a Larry Summers protege from Treasury. He worked his way up during the summer's years at Treasury. He's 47 years old. He looks like he's about 32. Universally liked and respected. Extremely smart, extremely aware of the stuff. Very discreet, controlled. And he sort of serves as an intermediary between Washington and Wall Street because he sits in Manhattan, but he works for the Federal Reserve System. So Geithner, Geithner was there in the late 1990s. He was, that's why I keep making sure that you don't forget about Geithner when I'm showing the picture of these three. So in the late 1990s, when they repealed Glass-Steagall, when they were fighting Brooks Lee Bourne, not allowing her into the black box and to regulate all of the derivatives, when uh, they were doing all of the deregulation, uh, Geithner was right there with them. He was right there with them. So then Bush comes in, and when Bush comes in, then Geithner goes to the New York Fed. He eventually ends up as the president of the New York Fed. So he's playing a key role, Timothy Geithner, 
and solving the problem that he helped create back in the 1990s with the deregulation and and blocking Brooksley Born from regulating derivatives. He helped create the problem and he's there at the New York Fed in 2008 and he has to oversee fixing the problem that he helped create. As an intermediary between Washington and Wall Street because he sits in Manhattan but he works for the Federal Reserve System. That night, Bear Stearns' fate would be in Tim Geithner's hands. Geithner's people went to Bear's headquarters and started to look through all the accounts. Geithner told me he initially thought that they uh, should let Bear go under. By midnight, by one, two in the morning, everybody and their mother has teams at Bear. Uh, Morgan, the Fed, the SEC, and they find out Bear is stuffed to the gills with toxic waste. They found billions in hidden subprime mortgage loans. And something worse, credit default swaps, a form of insurance. So Bear credit- promised if bonds it insured failed, they would pay. So credit default swaps, really very mysterious. credit default swaps are these swaps that if you remember the guy from uh, the movie and the book, Big, Big Short, Michael Burry, he's the guy who figured out that he was one of the guys who figured out, amongst others, that the housing market was getting ready to crash, and he wanted to to short the housing market. So he goes to these banks, and he gets these banks to create a financial instrument called the credit default swaps, was which was going to be a um, essentially a put on the housing market. Um, in the movie, if you watch the movie The Big Short, when he goes in to make this deal, I think with Goldman Sachs at first, they all laugh at him. <laughs> they all laugh at him and say, what are you talking about? You want to short the housing market? Because this is what the housing price had done up until then. I mean, it, it would have been stupid to short the housing market. But this guy, Michael Burry, saw what was going on. He went through all these securities, saw that they were filled with adjustable rates, uh, people with bad credit, and he knew the housing market. So he, he started uh, buying the credit default swaps. Later on, and if you watch the movie, um, you, you'll you see this plays out as well. Later on, and, and we'll talk about this in later podcasts because um, all the banks did this. Later on, when they find out that Michael Burry was right and that, and that they were exposed from all the credit default swaps that he and others had bought, then they start buying the credit default swaps as well to leverage out their exposure. So that's another thing you got to understand. Not only is Bear Stearns loaded down with these toxic assets as far as the subprime securities, CDOs, and derivatives that are based on the CDOs, they also have all of these credit default swaps as well. Swaps, a form of insurance. Bear had promised if bonds it insured failed, they would pay. They were really very mysterious instruments that only the sort of financial wizards understood. Credit default swap is basically just an agreement that I have with you where I sell you insurance on some bond you own. If the bond goes belly up, I promise to pay you. And as long as the bond doesn't go belly up, you pay me for, the, for selling you insurance. Geithner's investigators told him that Bayer had made credit default swap deals worth hundreds of billions of dollars all over Wall Street and around the world. Wow. Through the night, things changed as the people in the Fed discovered the positions that Bayer was in and discovered what would happen if they did go under. Because Bear Stearns was so indebted to so many other people, their failure to repay their debts or pay their debts would cause a cascade of other failures. Every single part of Wall Street at this point is plugged into another part of Wall Street. And if I go down, I can now drag down that guy. And if he goes down, he can drag down that guy. And he can drag down that guy. And this is a huge web that connects everyone in these completely unforeseen ways. And the reason that, the, that all these banks were uh, connected and, uh, and this web was uh, of such is because of the derivatives, the black box 
uh, derivatives that Brooks Lee Bourne tried to regulate back in the 1990s, and these guys blocked her from regulating these derivatives. Timothy Geithner's now uh, the head of the New York Fed and and trying to fix the problem that he created. The reason that the, that all of these banks were intertwined, and if Bear Stearns went down, they would go down, is because of the derivatives, and the derivatives were tied to the subprime securities, the the collateralized debt obligations. I want you to take a look at this article. What happened to Bear Stearns? I want to read a little bit of this for you. What happened to Bear Stearns? Bear Stearns, Bear Stearns uh, minted profits in the early 2000s from its aggressive stakes in collateralized debt obligations, CDOs which were securities that contained thousands of adjustable rate subprime mortgages. Um, at the street level, these home loans were sold by predatory lenders, not predatory lenders. They were sold by uh, lenders who George Bush told in 2002 that I want you to work to get me um, 40,000 minority um, homeowners into homes that they couldn't a- a- afford. Oh, no, predatory lenders. George Bush was predatory. He told them, to come up with creative ways to finance. At the street level, these homes were sold by predatory lenders who often target targeted low-income minority home buyers. No, George Bush told them to go after low-income minority home buyers. That was all part of a George Bush's American Dream plan and why he created the, the down payment assistance like Kamala Harris is doing. It all came from George Bush. Poorly explained and complex uh, in nature, these uh, the terms of these subprime loans started uh, out inexpensively. Uh, some even allowed the borrower to buy a house with zero down payment, interest only. Uh, those those are part of interest only, option arm, adjustable rates. All of these were the creative financing that George Bush told the lenders to do. But after a short introductory period. Subprime mortgages shot up several hundred dollars a month, if not more. The housing sector was simply unstoppable back back then. Housing prices had doubled uh, between 1989 and 2007. Housing prices doubled from 1989 to 2007. That's the housing prices. That's why they laughed at Michael Burry when he said he wanted to short it. Um doubled between uh, 1989 and 2006, and housing-related industries accounted for nearly half of all new jobs. I already explained that to you. But as more and more people signed on to these mortgages, uh, they actually couldn't afford a bubble form. Bush caused the bubble in the housing market. Even then, Fed, Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan uh, voiced his concerns. So this article says that even Alan Greenspan this guy who set the whole thing up, who was there with these guys, setting all that. Even Alan Greenspan voiced his concerns about the housing market. What's the date on this that Alan Greenspan is voicing his concerns? 2005. Well, in 2004, a year before that, Dean Baker had already written this article in The Nation, Bush's House of Cards. He wrote this a year earlier. People were already sounding the alarm and saying that, that that this is a bubble and it's getting ready to crash. So you're telling me that Alan Greenspan comes a year after Dean Baker writes Bush's House of Cards? He comes a year later and he, he voices his concern after he set up the crash? Nothing can be further from the truth. After George Bush uh, creates the bubble with his American Dream home ownership program, they're all working together. And this is what Alan Greenspan's concerns were. The apparent, the apparent uh, fourth uh, in housing markets are front. Uh, oh, the apparent froth um, in housing markets uh, may have spilled over into mortgage markets. This is Alan Greenspan, and he's he's testifying in front of Congress in 2005 when Dean Baker and others were already sounding the alarm. So. It's ridiculous This what, what Alan Greenspan is saying in this congressional testimony. But he says, the apparent froth of the housing markets may have spilled over into the mortgage markets. The 
dramatic increase in the prevalence of interest only loans, as well as introductory introduction of other relatively exotic forms of adjustable rate mortgages are developments of particular concern. To be sure, these financing financing vehicles have their appropriate uses. Yeah, Bush told them to use it. But to the extent that some of these households may be employing uh, these instruments to purchase a home that would otherwise be unaffordable, their use is being uh, beginning to add to the pressure in the marketplace. In 2005, he's warning about the adjustable rate uh, interest only loans and what was taking place. You set it up, Alan Greenspan. All right, so this is the important part that I want to get to right here. I was Bear Stearns connected to the mortgage in- industry. As soon as homeowners had signed their uh, papers and picked up their keys, firms like Bear Stearns were bundling these mortgages into, into these subprime securities, thousands of other, uh, and transfer them into, uh, into uh, uh, securitizing them into liquid financial vehicles like CDOs, which are basically uh, mortgage-backed securities, again, uh, that could be traded by industrial um, or uh, institutional investors like hedge funds. Institutional investors like hedge funds. Here's the important part. CDOs were categorized by slices of uh, trunches according to uh, the variables like their underlying home values or credit uh, score uh, of the mortgage holders, uh, credit ratings of agency, credit rating agencies would assign uh, uh, grades to these tranches. So the credit rating agencies, and, and we told you Finch, Moody's, S&P, uh, Standards & Poor's, there are others, but those are the big three, uh, Moody's, Finch, uh, Standards & Poor's, Credit uh, rating agencies would assign grades to these tranches, to these subprime securities that people were betting on. AAA was the highest uh, and uh, safest rating. It was uh, um, directed to Class A securities, which usually uh, sported the the lowest yield along uh, the lines of Treasury securities. So basically, it's saying that. Uh, that the AAA Class A securities, the because um, they had those ratings, they gave you the lowest real yield, but they were the least risky. So the rating ag- agencies were putting these ratings on these securities, uh, and they rated a lot of. That's fraud. They rated a lot of these securities AAA that were not AAA. People were betting on them, investing their money on them, thinking that they were safe. That I'm going to get take the low yield. I'm going to take the 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 low profit by by the safe investment, and they weren't safe at all. Is is basically what happened. While lower rated tranches, such as Class B and Class C securities, contained uh, subprime uh, uh, mortgages, these boosted uh, much higher yields to offset their increase in risk. So the people that were buying these these AAA securities, thinking that they were safer, were getting less profit. Uh, because they they felt that they were they weren't as risk adverse. If I was risk, if I was more risk adverse and I wanted to get more profit, then I would be investing in these Class B and these Class C securities. But I want to be safe. I'm a safe investor, so I'll invest in the Class A. But the Class A was not Class A at all. They were loaded with subprime securities. The rating agencies. If you want to know who should have gone to jail first, it should have been the executives at these rating agencies. All right, this last paragraph, I want you to, this is, gets us back to the derivatives. And uh, and this is what I suspected, that these financial vehicles, these uh, cl- collateralized debt obligations, these CDOs that were, sub, uh, or that were mortgage-backed securities, these financial vehicles soon grew more and more complex, hard to understand. The derivatives, black box derivatives, uh, go back to Bankers Trust, go back to uh, to um, the other scandal that we talked about uh, two podcasts ago, the um, um, God, what's it called? The um, it was the two uh, scandals that we talked about in um, two podcasts ago. Bankers Trust was one, and 
The other one was long-term capital management. So bankers trust and long-term capital management. Um, they, uh, that's what happened in the 1990s. And that were huge scandals that exposed how complex these derivatives were. That's why Brooks Lee Bourne was trying to regulate them. And she was blocked by Geithner, Summers, uh, Greenspan and, uh, Rubin. So, um, back to this paragraph, these financial vehicles soon grew more and more complex. CDOs were spun out from other CDOs, this is Bear Stearns and other banks doing this. So uh, they're creating these CDOs. Uh, these We're going to go into more about what CDOs are here in just a moment. Um, when firms ran out of products, they actually created synthetic CDOs. So you have CDOs and synthetic CDOs. So uh, they, they would create the CDOs to sell. And then when they ran out of those products, they would create synthetic CDOs to sell which were made uh, entirely of derivatives. So the synthetic CDOs were made of derivatives. So this is what Bear Stearns was selling. And not only Bear Stearns, other uh, banks were selling derivatives that were made out of synthetic CDOs. So let's talk a little bit more about what CDOs are and synthetic CDOs. And uh, for that, we're going to go back to the movie, uh, The Big Short, this is Anthony Bourdain explaining in the big short what a CDO is. A collateralized debt obligation. It's important to understand because it's what allowed a housing crisis to become a nationwide economic disaster. Here's world famous chef Anthony Bourdain to explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm a chef on a Sunday afternoon setting the menu at a big restaurant. I ordered my fish on Friday, which is the mortgage bond that Michael Burry shorted but some of the fresh fish doesn't sell. I don't know why, maybe it just came out, halibut has the intelligence of a dolphin. So what am I gonna do? Throw all this unsold fish, which is the triple B level of the bond in the garbage, and take the loss? No way. Being the crafty and morally onerous chef that I am, whatever crappy levels of the bond I don't sell, I throw into a seafood stew. See, it's not old fish, it's a whole new thing. And the best part is they're eating three day old halibut. That is a CDO. So a CDO is uh, basically the, like he just says, the the part of uh, the bond that don't sell uh, the um, class class B, class C, um, the riskier uh, uh, parts of the bond that are just thrown together in a CDO uh, with other bonds um, or with other mortgages and they create the collateralized debt obligation. Now, uh, this is the same movie uh, explaining what the synthetic CDO is. And remember, the synthetic CDOs are made from derivatives. Okay, so here's how a synthetic CDO works. Let's say I bet 10 million on a blackjack hand. 10 million because this hand is meant to represent a single mortgage bond. Okay, Selena has a pretty good hand here, showing 18, dealer showing seven. That's a really good hand for Selena. Good odds. In fact, your chances of winning this hand are 87%. So, my odds are good. I'm on a winning streak. Everybody in this place wants to get in on the action. How could I lose, right? Now, this is a classic error. In basketball, it's called the hot hand fallacy. A player makes a bunch of shots in a row. People are sure they're gonna make the next one. People think whatever's happening now is gonna continue to happen into the future. During the real estate boom, markets were going up and up and people thought they would never go down. So people who are watching and think that I won't lose will make a side bet. Now this is the first synthetic CDO. I love Selena Gomez. I bet you 50 million she wins. And I'll give you a three to one odds. Three to one odds? Okay, I'll take that bet. Now, Somebody else is going to want to make a bet on the outcome of their Actually, bet. 50 million she wins. That will lead to synthetic CDO number two. Hey, I bet you 200 million that lady in the glasses wins that bet. She probably will win. So I want a great payoff. How about 21? Deal. 
So the, so the synthetic CDO is betting on the uh, success of the CDO. The CDO is all of the uh, trash mortgages that are risky, uh, that are put together. I mean, and and the, the synthetic CDOs, which are made out of derivatives, are in a complete black box, complete unregulated, because these guys did not allow Brooksley Bourne to regulate them in the 1990s after the um, after the uh, Bankers Trust and the um, um, other scandal that we were just talking about, that that they blocked Brooksley Bourne from regulating these things. So these synthetic CDOs, which were made completely of deri- derivatives, trillions of dollars, completely unregulated, completely unregulated. I'm going to read a little bit of this article and then we'll get back into this in the next podcast. But um, this is talking about Jimmy Kane. Jimmy Kane was the CEO of Bear Stearns, who uh, was the CEO when all of this, this was going on. Um, just read a little bit of uh, this paragraph in the next. It says, two months before Bear Stearns collapse, Kane, Jimmy Kane, gave up his day-to-day role as chief executive to Alan Schwartz who Alan Schwartz gave evidence alongside him. So this is talking about a congressional uh, a hearing that they're at where they're saying that Alan Schwartz was at this hearing with Jimmy Kane and he gave evidence and testified alongside of Jimmy Kane. So Jimmy Kane um, resigns as CEO two months before the collapse. And then this guy, Alan Schwartz, uh, becomes CEO and they're both there testifying at the congressional hearing. Schwartz drew a picture of mounting panic in 2008 as the U.S. housing market collapsed and Wall Street realized that these highly sophisticated mortgage derivatives did not deserve the high ratings bestowed on them by the by the credit rating agencies. This is the new CEO. Of, of the company just two months before Bear Stearns collapse, saying that he's saying that these derivatives that the rating agencies, Moody's, Finch, Standards & Poor's, were rating these derivatives, and they were giving them high ratings, AAA ratings, and they didn't deserve it. And this is what Alan Schwartz is saying. This is a quote from Alan Schwartz in the testimony. There was a uh, um, reliance there was a reliance on ratings to work out the balance sheets that we were relying on the rating agencies, that there was a reliance on the, the uh, ratings to work out the balance sheet said Schwartz, who suggested that it became impossible to work out the risk profile of any bank. There was a lack of transparency in these instruments. It became impossible to determine which ones were risky and which ones were not. And he's talking about the mortgage derivatives, the same derivatives that Brooksley Bourne tried to regulate back in the 1990s. And these clowns blocked her from regulating along with Timothy Geithner. It was a black box. And, and the CEO of, of, of Bear Stearns is saying that we didn't, we, we didn't understand these things. It was impossible to know because of the lack of transparency to listen to this clip this is associated press why don't you listen what they say here bear stearns was the first wall street bank to implode and is being looked at as a case history of an institution that operated in what's being called a shadow banking system a shadow markets operating outside the regulatory structure operating outside of the regulating uh, regulatory structure in a shadow banking system Brooksley Bourne tried to bring them out of the shadows in the 1990s, and these guys, they blocked her. All right, um, I will be back um, on Friday, and we'll cover more of this. I didn't really even get into Obama's part. When we get back on Friday, I'm going to get right into Obama's part, and I'll see you guys on Friday. Thank you so much for listening and watching.